my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page uh, and youtube channel i would like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar and today it's our 77 international physics webinar so good evening to all here in bangladesh and a very good morning to all those who are watching this program live from usa hope you are well and safe from corona pandemic so all we know that we are uh, staying in a corona pandemic situation and all the institution have been shut, shut down due to corona since march 2022 so we cannot continue our normal academic program inside the campus so we have to start our uh, online program to continue our academic program i think you have already come to know that our department department of this partner university of science and technology have already started its, its uh, uh, online program including online classes and online international physics webinar and, and i'm happy to share with you all that we have successfully completed our 76 international physics webinar so we are trying to adjust with this new normal situation uh, so today is very important day for our department today i'd like to welcome you all to a joint session between department of physics pabna university of science and technology and the department of physics uh, arts uh, department of physics college and integrate uh, integrative science and arts faculty of science and mathematics arizona state university in nanotechnology and we have with us here today dr maxim shuprabev uh, professor department of physics uh, College and Integrative Science and Arts, Faculty of Science and Mathematics, Arizona State University, USA, connecting with us from USA, and he has already connected with us. So I'd like to welcome our speaker. So good morning, sir, and uh, uh, good evening, too. Uh, so welcome to our International Physics webinar. And uh, uh, I'd like to uh, say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology, for accepting our invitation, sir. So the main aim of our uh, web webinar is to motivate and encourage our students in this uh, corona pandemic situation. You know that uh, uh, when the COVID has uh, uh, started, so uh, all the institutions have been shut down, so students uh, uh, must go back their uh, home. So they may be frustrated in that time. So we thought that we should do something to encourage our students. So uh, we have started our webinar in June, and uh, I'd like to say thanks all the uh, speaker and all those who helped me in uh, doing this. So uh, today it's our 77th and uh, uh, for those who are new, I'd like to uh, introduce that uh, uh, we, we have divided our webinar into three parts. First, uh, we'd like to introduce our speaker with all of you and then uh, our speaker will deliver his piece. And at the end, we have a discussion time. In that time, anybody can join with us and you can also ask questions by commenting. So I think you have already come to know the title of this today's uh, International Physics webinar, and the title is the Predicting and the Understanding Optics at True Nanoscale from Strong Coupling to Harmonic Generation. And our speaker is Dr. Maxim Shukrabe, and he's a kind of working as a uh, professor at the Department of Physics, Arizona State University. And he's a professor of physics. He joined Arizona State University in 2008. He received his master's degree in theoretical physics from Moscow Engineering University, sorry, Engineering Physics Institute, Moscow, Russia, in 1997. Uh, in 2000, he completed and defended his doctoral thesis in laser physics at the Department of High Power Laser in the uh, General Physics Institute of the Russian Academy of Science, Moscow, Russia. From 1998 to 2001, he worked as a research assistant at the Fiber Optic Research Center, Moscow, Russia. In 2001, uh, he worked as a research assistant at the Fiber Optics Research Center, Moscow, Russia. Uh, in 2001, he received the French Ministry Research Postdoctoral Fellowship and joined uh, the research group of Professor Anik Sujar Weiner uh, at the laboratory of the molecular photophysics in the University of Paris, South uh, France. Uh, during his uh, appointment, he was involved in the research of optimal and the coherent control of atoms and molecules in strong laser fields in summer of 2003. He joined the research group of Professor Tamar uh, Seidman at the Department of Chemistry, Northwestern University, uh, Illinois, as a postdoctoral fellow, performing simulation of optical properties of classical and quantum system in strong laser field. His current research interests include computational nano optics, coherent control, and physics of laser matter, interacting in strong and ultra strong coupling 
uh, regimes. And you can see his research area, nanoscience and materials physics, theoretical solid state physics, computational physics, plasmon resonance, assisted uh, control of atoms and molecules, coherent control of light and matter, computational nano optics. And we can see his professional experience uh, in the, uh, the slide. And this is his visiting professorship. So, and this is his honor and uh, awards from different organization. And uh, this is his research grant. So we can see his uh, Google score ID and we can see that uh, his citation number is uh, more than 1600. And uh, this is his uh, research gate ID. So his research gate number is 35.83. And this is his uh, rec uh, recent published and accepted paper, though he has updated his uh, uh, this list. So thanks all for all of your uh, patience. And now it's time to go to our speaker. So thanks again, sir, for joining with us and accept, for accepting our invitation. It's your time. You can start your session. Oh, my, my, my pleasure. So <clears throat> let me share this. So I'm already sharing the screen, right? So uh, let me start the, the presentation in uh, one second, please. So do you see the full screen of my presentation? Yeah, we can see. OK, good. Well, thanks a lot for inviting me. So this is really weird uh, times we live in. Uh, on one hand, it's, uh, it's weird in the sense that uh, the world stopped. On the other hand, it became really small because people adopted. And now we have these webinars that you guys uh, hold in Bangladesh. And then I'm here in Arizona, which is, oh, what is it, almost 12 hours apart, right? And um, so I'm, I'm glad you guys invited me. So uh, let me share um, um, recent uh, work that we've done in my group. And I'll try to be as general as possible, realizing that uh, most of you are not familiar with what I'm going to talk about. So uh, generally, when I give talks, I uh, ask people to ask questions uh, anytime. So but I guess the format is slightly different. All right. Anyway, so. So before I begin, let me quickly uh, um, acknowledge um, a wide collaborative network I have. So the funding comes from uh, Department of Defense in the U.S. And uh, this is the grant of Binational Science Foundation that allowed me to travel to Israel for uh, five years. So now it, uh, it, uh, we, we're done with that grant, but this one is ongoing. So I have a wide collaboration with experimental groups, which is the probably the most important part for any theoretician. So Adi Salomon is doing outstanding work on um, nanoscale plasmonic systems. We'll talk more about what that means and so on. But so she's the one responsible for very uh, for many experiments I'm going to mention today. Renaud Valley is my um, uh, collaborator from France. So uh, at the beginning of in the middle of this talk, I'll mention our work. Matthew Pelton and Heiko Tunian are two guys uh, with uh, with whom I uh, recently published, uh, almost published a paper in nanoletters. And Nien Uigea, she's at UC Irvine. Uh, so this is uh, an experimentalist uh, whom I worked with uh, to explain a couple of things on uh, second harmonic generation. So I'll mention our work as well. The theory collaboration invo involves uh, Joseph Zies, uh, Abe Nitsan, who used to be in uh, Tel Aviv University, but now at UPenn and my brilliant uh, uh, PhD student, Yelena Drobnik. All right, so this is the brief outline of my talk. At the beginning, um, I will introduce what I'm working on to give you as uh, wide concept as possible without going in too much details. So why are we interested in uh, nanostructures? What we mean by nanostructures? Uh, what do we mean by controlling light? And so on and so forth. So the second part is... Uh, the most important one is where we contributed a lot. So we're basically building a physical computational model of materials we're going to talk about at the beginning. And then I'll show you two applications. One of them is the linear optics, where we discuss the collective fluorescence of molecules placed in the close proximity of uh, metal mirrors. And the other one is um, our recent work on nonlinear optics, where we implement, uh, uh, where we use our physical model and actually uh, do simulations of real experiments, which is the most exciting part of, for all theoreticians. All right, so let's talk about nanostructures. So what do we mean by nanostructures? So let's consider 
how electromagnetic radiation behaves at a particular metal interfaces that are corrugated. Uh, with corrugation sizes, um, characteristic length less than the wavelength. So if we are talking about visible part of spectrum, let's say blue light about 500, uh, no, 500 is red, uh, is green line, right? So about 400 nanometers or so. So the sizes of systems we're discussing are on the order of 100 nanometers or less, okay? Now, <clears throat> if I am to consider a very simple exercise of calculating uh, the efficiency of scattering of a simple spherical particle of a size of about 50 nanometers in diameter, and this is a silver nanoparticle. Um, so I launched the plane wave, and I'm interested in how much light is scattered by this particular uh, uh, particle as a function of the wavelength of the incoming light. Right? So we all know the diffraction limit, and one would expect to see a flat line because the size of the particle is somewhere right over here at the very, at the very end. Right? But surprisingly, we actually see a strong resonance, which is around 400 nanometers, and this is what is called surface plasmon resonance. What really happens is when you drive the system <clears throat> at the particular resonant frequency, conduction electrons begin to oscillate collectively, and since they are charged particles and they're moving with acceleration, they produce a secondary field which builds up on the surface of the particle, enhancing the light. Okay, so this is example of surface plasma. Localized means that we're talking about uh, finite system. So we we'll also talk about surface plasma uh, uh, polaritons that propagate, and that will be the discussion of the surface plasmons on, um, let's say, periodic arrays of holes and so on. So we'll come to that in a, in a minute. So let me visualize what it means enhancing light. So this is the uh, nanoparticle, and you have a plane wave that is uh, emanating from the left and it's propagating to the right and is vertically polarized. And what you're looking at are instantaneous snapshots of electromagnetic intensity, basically. So uh, these oscillations are on the order of a half, uh, 1.5 femtoseconds. So this is about 400 nanometers wavelength. So you can clearly see the buildup of the intensity on the surface of the particle. You, you also see part of the light comes through. Now, uh, it might uh, uh, come as a surprise, of course, but because it's a metal, but in reality, the size of the metal here is approximately the size of the skin layer, right? So we, this means that partially light comes through even though there are losses inside, okay? So that's the example of a localized surface plasma. One thing to note, and it's very important, is that these bright spots uh, represent um, very intense local hotspots where the local field is three, four orders of magnitude greater than the intensity of the laser. And, and by the way, these are, of course, simulations. So you cannot measure that, right, in experiment with the precision of one femtosecond, of course, right? All right, so that's one thing. Another one, if you are to build a periodic array of holes, so the size of these holes are on the order of maybe 60, 70 nanometers in diameter. And overall, this is the metal film. And in these particular simulations, I believe this was... Uh, this was silver as well, okay, right. So this is the hexagonal array, okay? And the precision with which these arrays could be made in experimental labs are just outstanding. is an order of a nanometer, even less than that. So the thickness of the metal is about 200, 300 nanometers, and these holes are going all the way through. So that system is usually placed on the surface of glass and covered with some dielectric on top to avoid oxidization, right? So when you shine the light, these holes begin to radiate the field back and they begin to um, induce the surface waves that we just witnessed uh, in, um, in the example of nanoparticle, but these surface waves are also oscillations of conduction electrons, but this is the continuous metal, right? It's not a finite one. So even at periodic, the size of this in the actual experiments are maybe 10 microns or so. And the distance between these guys are 400, 500 nanometers. So this is really small. So when you shine the light and um, see how much light comes through, this is what we call transmission, and how much light is reflected back, this is a reflection. And one means 100%, right? So uh, transmission and a reflection exhibit a couple of peaks. So this peak over here, 
uh, around 1.6 uh, uh, electron volts. That's the the uh, surface plasmon mode uh, corresponding to this electromagnetic wave that sort of stick to the surface at the interface and propagates in the lateral direction. So this is the top view. So if I am uh, to shine the light perpendicular to the picture and polarized in this direction at this particular wavelength, the local field will exhibit really interesting properties with hot spots and whatnot, very similar to what we've seen a, a couple of minutes ago for a spherical nanoparticle. So let me show you how it looks like. So in a second, I'll show you the dynamics the same, uh, the same dynamics as before, but now this will be a uh, uh, detector that sits right under one of the holes on the output side. So the light comes through and I'm detecting the electromagnetic intensity on the output side of this system as a function of uh, time. So there it is. The light comes through. In, in our case, this is, uh, there it is. So the K vector of the pump is at us and is polarized this way. I'm looking from the other side of this system. You can clearly see this hole. You can also see that the local field is strongly enhanced and highly homogeneous. So this is about 400 nanometers. And the wavelength is what maybe seven, six hundred nanometers or so, and these hot spots are on the size of tens of nanometers, very, very small. So the light dies off and the system uh, stops. Um, now you can play a lot of tricks manipulating the um, quality of these local fields and how they look like and how they behave as a function of distances and whatnot by changing the shapes of the holes. So this is the work um, that we, we've done uh, in collaboration with Adi Solomon. We're actually doing these type of things in the lab. So this is the periodic array of triangular holes. So this is just a unit cell, of course, right? So this is the uh, metal. And I think we, um, I believe we considered gold in here. Uh, on top of the glass substrate, and this is the periodic system in all directions. And the hole looks like a triangular hole. Right. So you can examine whether this hole is a, a, a isocellus a triangle a, or a collateral triangle and whatnot. So when you perform simulations or perform measurements and uh, see the spectrum of transmission and reflection, you will see lots and lots of resonances. The system is really complex. And many, many resonances represent a uh, coupling between the holes in different directions and uh, uh, this particular resonance over here, this is again transmission black, R is reflection, and 1 minus T minus R corresponds to absorption, right? Because the energy is conserved. So in this case, you see this resonance around 1.8 by 0.9 electron volts, and this is the local resonance associated with a single hole. The next resonance around 2.51 is what is called Bragg resonance. So this is the propagating surface plasmon that is responsible for hole-to-hole -hole interaction and a bunch of other things and so on. So this, again, let me demonstrate how these um, local fields behave depending on at which wavelength I'm exciting the system. So this is the localized surface plasmon. So I'm pumping the system at this frequency. And again, I'm looking at plane that is really close to the hole. You can see this hole, triangular hole and the local field is enhanced about the edges of the hole, right? So this is the sort of a single hole response, even though the system, of course, is periodic, the interaction between holes uh, doesn't really matter much for this particular uh, frequency. So this is the Bragg surface plasmon. This is narrow resonance right over here. You can clearly see the difference that the fields are sort of propagating, right? Not only you have enhancement at the edges, you also have a propagation and uh, the energy exchange between the holes and so on. So very, uh, very interesting, right? So now how can we utilize that? Uh, so one of the ideas um, um, is to use uh, molecular assemblies, such as J aggregates, dye molecules, quantum dots, uh, dropped on the surface of these types of systems and adjusting the uh, um, resonances of this plasmon mode such that the molecules are also resonant and if they happen to uh, land in these hot spots these molecules will be driven by the local field due to plasmon so if the coupling strength surpasses 
the um, damping rates of all uh, uh, materials, we enter what is called strong coupling regime, which is very easy to illustrate. Imagine that you have two dipoles, right? Two nanoparticles. Uh, each particle has a particular resonance, as I showed you a couple of minutes ago, right? This me resonance, a localized surface plasma. So if these particles are identical really far away and I shine the light, they don't really communicate, right? There is no energy exchange. But if I bring them really close together, uh, these two identical oscillators, uh, what chemists call hybridized, right? So hybridization happens. And then because of the interaction, instead of a single resonance, now you have two resonances. One is the anti-symmetric and the other one is symmetric. So in the field of research where I'm working with, uh, where, where I'm working at, uh, this is called upper polarotonic state and this is called lower polarotonic state. So to demonstrate the idea, is the following. Imagine you have a two-level system, right? Uh, Adam, of course, has many, many levels, but let's assume we're working with a particular resonance such that other levels could be neglected. So I have one atom, and let's say I place this atom or molecule in the particular uh, confined optical field like cavity, right? Or um, in the close proximity of a nanoparticle or a periodic array of holes where you have this local field enhancement, right? And if the energy of this local field mode corresponds to the transition of the molecule, then I have the hybrid light matter states. So these are um, uh, um, uh, hybridized states. So this is the lower polariton states and the other polariton state. So in relative cavity transmission, you will have the splitting of this resonance because of the coupling. And the distance between these peaks measured in energy is what is called Rabi splitting, R-A-B-I splitting, corresponds to the how strong the coupling between these two oscillators is, right? So theoretically, this is easy to understand if you are to follow the perturbation theory in quantum mechanics everybody learned right in the undergrad so you have molecular system you have plasmonic system and delta is the coupling between them so you diagonalize this and you end up with this square root plus minus so these are two hybrid states now so if delta is zero then you of course you get uh two states back but when delta is non zero you have the splitting so this is called Rabi splitting now it's all cool uh, and so on but can we actually do that in experiment well the answer is yes <clears throat> um so let me just quickly demonstrate what it means to have a strong coupling of two oscillators so i found this uh, video online that looks really really cool and precisely corresponds to physics we're discussing even though our physics is much more complex than this video so the video is is really cool you can google that it's in youtube i forgot the uh, the author of that so you have um a strong magnet here the other strong magnet here and the magnet in the middle is glued to the surface okay so if you are there it is so if you are to tip let me start it again if you are to tip one magnet this guy begins to oscillate and because of the strong coupling through this magnet in the middle the energy is transferred back and forth you see the energy bouncing back and forth now think of this system as a bunch of molecules and now this system as the actual plasmonic mode that we looked at so many times today so the energy will bounce back and forth and the system forms uh, what is called hybrid state that has both uh, properties of both molecular uh, molecules and plasmons. So matter and light at the same time. That's what's cool about it. So now in terms of experimental realization. So if you are to consider periodic array of holes, for example, you can adjust the periodicity of the system. You can tune the angle of incidence with which you probe the system with the laser field. And then these modes that we talked about begin to change a little bit because of the dispersion. Now, if you have a good chemist, that chemist can throw what is called G-aggregates that have a significant, huge local dipole moment. And they are resonant at approximately the same wavelength as one of these uh, periodic systems. So these molecules self-assemble on a surface forming this rice, right? It looks like rice. Now you shine the light. And if this resonance falls exactly where plasmon is and you have enough molecules the strong coupling occurs and now you see the rabi splitting this is the experimental result so molecular excitation is 
uh, interacting with local plasmons, molecules interacting with local plasmons, and the total system is split in two because of the strong coupling and the energy exchange between molecules and plasmons. Now, if you start tuning uh, these resonances and go through the molecular one, you recover what is called avoided crossing. So if you recall uh, the formula I showed you with the square root, so this is the plus square root and this is the minus square root, right? So very nicely and beautifully done. Now, it's all cool, and um, one doesn't really need to have uh, access to supercomputers or sophisticated models in order to uh, diagonalize two by two matrix. So undergrads can do that, right? Uh, now, uh, the problem is in this case is that the local fields, as you saw, are very complex, and there is no way I can run uh, one. One can write a simple analytical expression for the fields to calculate the coupling and whatnot. So thus, one is really um, required to do um, modeling. So let me talk about physical model of exciton plasmon material. So now we understand the word plasmon means metal, usually silver or gold, uh, sometimes aluminum. And exciton means molecular exciton. So one excitation when the system is excited, a mole molecule is excited, this is what is called uh, exciton. So this is the uh, 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 exciton plasmon nanomaterials. <clears throat> so now, equations of motion. So we start with realizing that the field um, is classical. So we are not quantizing the field, even though there is way of doing it. But it, one cannot really go really deep into details of uh, electromagnetic uh, field quantization if you couple it to uh, molecular excitons because... Um, well, you cannot really do a lot of uh, uh, simple calculations there. Now. So in Maxwell's equations we trust, so this is the Faraday law of induction, this is the um, Ampere law, and the important part is to be able to model material reaction. So this is the polarization and the time derivative as the polarization current, right? So in space uh, with metal dielectric, we use the Jude Lorentz model for m m material response. And when uh, places of, uh, um, uh, space occupied by molecules, we need to do quantum dynamics. So this is sort of a general theme of what we do. Now, one has to be really careful when modeling molecule, molecular response because, so let me demonstrate why that is. So this is the set of equations, right? We saw Maxwell's equations. And uh, where molecules are, I have to solve either Schrodinger equation or in this case, Louisville von Neumann equation. And I calculate the local um, quantum average dipole moment multiplied by the number density of molecules gives me the polarization, which enters the uh, uh, Ampere law and, and so on and so forth. So you do this self-consistently. One important thing to realize is that the local field um, near metal surface or near any corrugation is highly polarized. So what I mean by that? So look at this picture. Uh, you see the blue color. Imagine that there is no double slit here. It's just empty space. So you will see blue color everywhere. So this is just a plane wave that propagates from left to right and vertically polarized. Now, when the system interacts with any corrugation, in this case, just sharp corners or uh, sub wavelength slits, the red color appears. So the red color corresponds to the induced component. So the incident field is vertically polarized blue. And this is a horizontal polarization induced by the field. So. There are places in this region where, in this picture, where uh, black, I'm sorry, where blue and red colors superimpose, which means that the local field is actually rotating, right? Because you have oscillations this way and this way, and depending on the phase difference between them, the local field is actually changing along X and Y. So one has to be really careful with that. This means that the local two level model is not actually a two level model. In reality, it's a three level model right uh, excitation so you have the local field uh, the local uh, you have the ground state which is uh, s orbital and then you have to include all possible m states to account for x y and z polarizations of the local field so this seems uh, relatively tedious but doable now but if you are considering what is called the stimulated um, adiabatic Raman passage diagram with lambda type uh, molecules these becomes really complex. So we did these simulations uh, some time ago, 
and uh, one has to include all these bunch of states. So we do take that into account, but one has to be careful when you set up problem to ensure that you properly account for the local polarization of the field, okay? All right, so this is the essence of our model. So we have uh, Maxwell's equations. We, in the regions where metal is, if the metal is linear, i.e. we probe the system with the local or with the field which is significantly small, let's say 10 volts per meter, 100 volts per meter, where the response of metal is still uh, linear, the dielectric constant is either taken in, in the form of Jude model or Jude Lorentz model, where these parameters are basically fitting parameters that we take from experiment. Okay. Now, uh, where molecules are, we use this molecular part. We integrate either uh, Louisville von Neumann equation, in some cases, the Schrodinger equation locally for each point, and we have millions of these points, of course. Then we put and calculate uh, local polarization, plug it back into Ampere law, and solve all of this self consistently on a supercomputer. I'm going to spend maybe two minutes describing that. All right, so. Now, in the summary, you have every grid point occupied by quantum media is associated with a polarization density. The local density matrix or wave function, depending on which system you're looking at, is a product of individual density matrices. So we use mean field approximation, even though we have a couple of developments where we go a little bit beyond that, including the molecule-molecule correlations as well. So all grid points interactions are included. So there is dipole-dipole coupling directly through Maxwell's equations. Both linear and nonlinear optics on, on, the, on the level of uh, molecules is included. And we properly include all polarization properties of electromagnetic field. Now we can go beyond that and include uh, strong fields where um, conduction electrons behave nonlinearly. So this is done by hydrodynamic model where you basically write a very similar thing, what is called Navier-Stokes equation, a little bit uh, less involved, in, involved than that, but uh, very similar. So this is basically a second law of Newton for the hydrodynamic um, approximation of conduction electrons inside metal, where you have Lorentz force, you have a pressure term, you have convection, uh, convective derivative, you have a continuity equation, you put all of this together, and this system results in nonlinear response, which in turn gives you harmonic generation and a bunch of other things that are all included. So we all put it together and end up with a, a polarization uh, equation, vector equation that is coupled to Maxwell's equations as well. So all of this stuff is included in, in the model. Okay. So now, of course, uh, this is all cool and, and whatnot. If you write the code, uh, you... Uh, launch it on a single processor, it will tell you it's going to take you 100 years to simulate because it's very, very complex and very involved. So thus, we employ um, uh, parallel uh, supercomputers. So the idea of a parallelization is uh, very simple. Imagine that you have a domain of uh, points that you want to simulate. Each point is associated with the Maxwell's equations, uh, Schrodinger equation, and then the hard dynamic model and whatnot. So one can parallelize that's called 1D domain decomposition and you have slabs and each slab is carried by a single processor. It's very easy to write the code, but it's really bad scalability because if you increase number of processors, the, the system, uh, the execution time scales really badly. Now, the another one is called 2D pencil decomposition when you decompose your uh, uh, cube into these stencils, right? But it's a little bit more involved. It's still not a good scalability. So the best um, decomposition is done by decomposing the cube into subcubes, where each cube is handled by a single processor. And on the six faces of cubes inside, we have to perform send and receive operations of data needed for the nearby processor. So we've done that. And this is quite involved. But once you do that, the scalability uh, is very good. And the execution of our codes as much as they are complex, are on the order of hours, not weeks and days. Okay, just very quickly. So this is what we do, and we have our local cluster here. We assembled uh, uh, by pieces, right? This basically bought motherboards on one side and then CPU on the other, put it all together. We have a local cluster of 112 uh, processors, and we have access to supercomputers at DoD, uh, with thousands and thousands of processors. So typical number of uh, molecules simulated varies between 1 million and 10 million. 
All right, so let me quickly, before I actually jump into physics, um, in terms of actual work, let me quickly demonstrate how complex the dynamics of that system is when you are pump that system with a very strong laser field. So what I'm showing you is a snapshot right over here. This is the periodic array of, uh, of uh, slits. This is the cross section, so silver. This is the size. And then on top of that, I place molecular system. Uh, instead of showing you how the fields will look like, what I'm going to show you is the dynamics of the molecules, a red. So these molecules are right over here. So this red slab corresponds to all molecules in the ground state. Once you see the colors changing to uh, from red to dark blue, this means that the molecule at this particular point goes into the excited state. When you go up and down, the color goes from red to blue and back to red and so on, right? And there are 10 to the seventh molecules right over here. So you don't really see each molecule individually because, because there's so many of them. So the, uh, the excitation comes from the top and then excites the system everywhere. And what you expect to see is that the molecules close to the sharp corners first undergo the transition to the excited state because the local field is significantly higher here than here, for example. So I launched the field, and these are femtoseconds, so the field comes in, nothing is going on, and there you go. So you see the excitation of molecules here. You already under, uh, underwent uh, um, a couple of Rabi cycles going up and down, up and down, and these are slower, but the excitation propagates and the system exhibits really, really complex refractive index, and it's all sort of on a computer, and this is about 150 femtoseconds. So now the laser pulse is gone, and the system sort of stops and begins to decay to the ground state eventually in about maybe 500 femtoseconds, it's come back. All right, so now, having all of that in mind, let's start off with a simple exercise of examining how many molecules fluoresce in the presence of a flat surface. So what I want to do is to look at the fluorescence as a function of time for uh, molecules on the thin layer of dielectric in the particular proximity to a gold surface. So this is just a mirror. So what I expect to see is that when the molecules are fluoresce, right, they radiate the field, the field propagates in all directions, and when the field hits the metal surface, it bounces off and comes back, and there is some possible interference going on, and a bunch of other things may be expected, right? And so what is going on here is this is the work done by uh, Renaud Valley, and the idea is ours, and of course we did some simulations I'll show you in a second. So here you have basically photon counter as a function of time, right? So different colors indicate different types of uh, uh, systems. For example, the magenta line, the molecules on the surface of glass with no mirror and just covered by silica on top. And blue color means that uh, the molecules are actually um, inside that dielectric layer and there is uh, um, silica in between, uh, the dioxide silica, and, and then there is a gold surface, okay? So what you see is a function of time. And what you see is that if you take the log scale, this is the straight line, which means that there is a particular uh, decay rate of molecules. So because molecules fluoresce, they lose energy, right? So, and if you look at the decay rate of this linear guy, you will see that this is very similar to what you would expect from the single molecule, as if other molecules don't really interact, right? But then you see a very weird thing on the very short time scale right over here. You can see that there is additional decay component, which is significantly faster, right? Steeper. And this guy depends on the density of molecules. So two distinct rates were observed. Slow decay, individual fluorescence, and the very fast decay. And we um, um, uh, show that this is the collective fluorescence. So one really cool thing that Renault did was to measure these decay rates as a function of the thickness of this uh, spacer in between. So basically how much time it takes for the light to go from molecules to the mirror and bounce back and how the decay rate depends on this distance. So you would expect to see oscillations because of the interference, right? What you see is really cool. For slow decay rate, this is the slow decay as a function of the thickness of this spacer, you see the oscillations. What you also see is the decay, right? So every time you oscillate, it becomes 
smaller and smaller. So these results are reproducible, and these results basically explain the experiments by Drexach done in 1968. Uh, it's been known. So very close analogy is imagine that you have a single dipole that radiates in the presence of the mirror, right? So part of the radiation of dipole goes everywhere and disappears, never comes back. And a little part of it bounces off the mirror and comes back, right? So if you place that dipole further away from the mirror, this bounce back also happens, but with a low intensity because you're really far away and then you lose more energy to the far field. That's exactly uh, why you have the decay. So it's been known. So the collective decay, though, is really cool. It oscillates in the same way, but it never decays as a function of distance. And the close analogy to those who took electromagnetic courses is the two-dimensional uniformly charged plane that has a constant electric field. So you have so many molecules everywhere. They oscillate back and forth, and they generate nearly a plane wave that goes up or down, depending on which way you look at it, of course, bounces off the mirror, comes back, and in interacts with the molecules coherently. Okay, So we did these simulations. We calculated the decay rates. Uh, we saw these oscillations as well. And it's very simple to explain, right? You have um, emitted photons from which you can calculate the wavelength of the light emitted. And this bounces off the mirror, giving you the round trip of time. And then you can calculate when this constructive or destructive interference occurs. And you get precisely these zeros and maxima what is seeing in the experiment. All right. So now let me quickly go over the uh, nonlinear part. I skim over uh, a lot of things because uh, uh, I got to finish like in about maybe 20 minutes or so. Right. So now equipped with this um, um, model, um, sophisticated model of molecules and plasmons, I'm interested in learning the nonlinear response. So let me quickly just uh, pitch the idea. So you have Maxwell's equations, and remember that, right? And the, uh, the system, whatever that system is, metal, molecules, or metal and molecules combined, results in a polarization, a material reaction. Now, when you can write polarization as um, a Taylor series expanding over powers of local electric field, you end up with the linear theory, right? This is your linear response. This is your second order third order and so on and so forth. So this is second order process. And if you think of pumping the system at the given frequency, if the intensity is high enough, i.e. E squared is pretty high, then because of the presence of the second order nonlinearity, you are able to generate the second harmonic as well, right? Uh, and, and so on. So this will be the third harmonic and a bunch of other things. So you can have some frequency, difference frequency, here you will have a four wave mixing and then and, and whatnot, okay? So all of that is included in simulations because we don't really include chi two. We simulate uh, all the response and chi two sort of naturally pops up. So our um, model is non-perturbative, but it does contain nonlinearities, okay? So what we wanna do, we want to look at the harmonic generation by metal where conduction electrons now are treated as the liquid inside, right? So with the nonlinear terms included and whatnot. So if I launch the strong field, pump the system at one of the plasmon resonances and detect the signal as a function of the frequency of the outcoming beam, what I will see is the fundamental frequency. This is your relay scattering, right? This will be the second harmonic generation. This is the third harmonic generation. If the intensity is high enough, you even see the fourth harmonic generation, okay? So now uh, experimentally people can do that and we were, really eager to see so by the way yes that's the second harmonic so and we were e really eager to see uh how our model can compare it with experiment okay that's the third harmonic and so on all right so um one um, thing that we've done um, uh, nobody did before is to couple molecules with metal and the question was so what happens to this second harmonic generation if you have molecules in Remember, if you treat the molecule as a two-level system, because of the symmetry, two-level system cannot generate even harmonics. It can generate only odd harmonics because of the coupling, right? So you can only absorb one photon, three photons, five photons, and so on, but never two, four, or six, and so on. 
So if the coupling between plasmons it generates second harmonic, you have hybrid. So by writing simple analytical expression for two coupled oscillators with this coupling between them, that there is a contribution to the second order nonlinearity from molecules if there is a strong coupling, if there is a Rabi splitting we talked about, but uh, directly molecules do not contribute to the uh, second harmonic. So our prediction was that in the second harmonic generation, if there are many molecules and the strong coupling is seen in linear absorption, then the second harmonic must split in two. So, uh, so this is this work. We just uh, um, uh, it's nearly accepted at nanolayer. So we received yesterday a really good review. So we have to correct a couple of things, but it will be accepted in collaboration with Heike Rutinian at Emory University. So we looked at the single gold nanorods that support this plasmon resonance on top of what is called two-dimensional material, which is basically a huge exciton, right? So linear uh, absorption shows the Rabi splitting, and the single nanowire generates the second harmonic. So now we combine these two and look at, this is numerical model, this is the experiment, that the second harmonic is a function of the pump frequency. What you see is a really nice splitting of the second harmonic. So if there is no strong coupling, you will see a single peak. But then because of the strong coupling, you have second harmonic due to lower and upper hybridized polaritonic states where molecular signature is seen directly. So with these simulations, we also see that coupling and so on. So that's pretty cool, right? And now finally, uh, the last part, which is probably going to take me maybe about seven minutes or so, is to talk about how can we use second harmonic generation and plasmonic systems to learn uh, something about the system we're probing? So this is uh, another work in collaboration with a second um, experimental group at UC Irvine. Uh, so <clears throat> we look at the optical response of particles that are called crescents, nanocrescents. It's like a crescent, right? So basically, it's done. Uh, it's done of gold, and the thickness is about. 40 nanometers and the size is uh, 60 nanometers and about 200, 300 across. So they put it on top of glass and covered by uh, aluminum uh, um, oxide uh, uh, thin layer to uh, avoid high, um, uh, oxidization. Okay. So when we probe this system linearly, there is no nonlinear stuff yet. And my field is polarized along this direction, shorter axis. I have the resonance of the plasmon around 650 nanometers. So if I tune my polarization of the probe in this direction, longer axis, I have another plasmon. And if my tuning is somewhere in between, let's say 45 degrees, I have both modes popping up, right? So it's like a particle in the box, basically with two oscillatory uh, uh, length right uh, in one direction and another combined together you have two resonances uh, very nice so now the goal was to examine the uh, properties of these systems experimentally so these are uh, scanning electron images of these types of uh, nanocrescents there you see they are pretty pretty small and if you zoom in they are really nice right all right so this is the white light spectroscopy <coughs> absorbance experimentally measured so blue means that I polarized along shorter axis. Red means I polarized along longer axis. And S1, S2, these are for two sizes. So this is small size and this is larger size. You see that there is a shift, right? So in simulations, we see really nice correspondence, even though our resonances are a little bit uh, less broad, so more narrower. And of course, it's expected because the losses in our case are everything is perfect in theory, right? So if you introduce additional deviations from the size, you will completely recover the experimental results. So the question is, what can we learn about the second harmonic in that? So now let me explain these pictures. So let's assume that I am looking at a particular uh, nanocrescent. I fix the nanocrescent. Then I pump the system at the particular wavelength, let's say this guy, right over here, 1300 nanometers, OK? And then when I pump the system with a strong field, I detect second harmonic that is polarized along this direction or this direction. So these two guys. So basically, you put a polarizer on. And different dots indicate different 
um, rotation of the sample relative to the polarization of the intensity. So basically, this means that I'm looking at if you are to represent this, uh, this particle as the dipole, you can write down the second order susceptibility as a th uh, third uh, order tensor, right? And you have these dependencies on angles. So from these, what is called angular diagrams of the second harmonic, you can actually decipher these second order susceptibilities and find which ones are stronger and which ones are not. So for example, so this is X, right? And look at these guys. So you have a nice dipole popping up, right, along the 90 uh, degrees and 270 degrees. This means that this is um, sine squared dependence, right? Sine squared dependence means that you have a maximum along the vertical line, theta equals pi over 2, right? Uh, and psi x, y, y is the dominant, right? You don't see the peak along 0, 180 degrees. This means that this guy is 0. Now, another thing is for Y component, this guy, you have four lobes. Four lobes means this is sine times cosine. This means that this off diagonal element of susceptibility is very important. So you can um, measure this at different angles and uh, I'm sorry, different wavelength. And you clearly see this nice picture, right? So you have uh, a dipole along x and this quadrupole along y because of this sine theta cosine theta. So you know everything about that. So now we do simulation, see if you can recover that. So we do the same thing and we do the resonance and you clearly see this dipolar guy here and fourfold symmetry as it should be. So if you pump the system exactly at this point, you have both modes exciting at the same time. This means that this dipole and this dipole contribute equally, i.e. these and these two guys contribute equally. So this is the vertical plasma and this is the horizontal plasma. And if they contribute equally, you have that cross. And it's exactly what we see. And the, it's all good. The only problem is that in the experiment, these fourfold pictures are non-symmetric. And in our case, they are perfectly symmetric. So you can see the difference, right? So this is non-symmetric and this is actually symmetric. So the question was, uh, what the hell is going on? And our uh, goal in this work was to realize and understand the major contributor to this asymmetry in experiment. So we changed various things and we found that when the shape of a non-accrescent is no longer symmetric, then you can actually clearly see the asymmetry. So let me explain what it means. So how do you form the crescent? Well, you naively have one uh, circle and the other one is superimposed one on the other, irrespective of where this dashed circle is, you always get a symmetric picture, right? So this non-accrescent is always symmetric with respect to up and down. Now, if you superimpose ellipse on the circle, it's no longer symmetric depending on how elongated that ellipse is, thus breaking the symmetry. So if you do this in the simulations, so this is symmetric picture, now I do ellipse on the circle, Boom, you see that asymmetry popping up. So tiny small deviation from the perfect symmetric shape results in a very highly detectable asymmetric uh, uh, signal. Moreover, if you throw random pixels on the order of a thousand of them, you can actually see the asymmetry popping up as well. And depending how many pixels you have here compared to here, these two lobes could be longer or shorter. So you can even look at the uh, detection of the second harmonic signal and by looking at this diagram of four uh, lobes by looking at which lobe is longer you can tell which side of the particle is less symmetric than the other one so that's pretty cool so like for example here you can even uh, go into the uh, extreme details when this asymmetry becomes so huge that right over here you have actually two long lobes and two very short ones even though the optical linear response of that is nearly the same as without pixels that's how cool that thing is okay and i'm done so i presented the model of exciton plus mon materials and i expanded those to account for nonlinear optical response of metal systems we talked about exciton <coughs> plus mon systems and that they show unique second harmonic generation that has multiple well-resolved peaks corresponding to hybrid modes. We apply our model to investigate second harmonic and nanowire coupled to a 
tungsten to selenide to dematerial and experimentally uh, our prediction of the splitting of the second harmonic was verified. We also examined how second harmonic signals generated by nanocrescents depend on incident polarization and found that um, the asymmetry in experiment um, is explained by a small deviation of a uh, perfect shape of nanocrescent from um, um, the actual perfect shape. So, and uh, with this, I, I want to stop and uh, thank you, whoever is listening to me right now. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. So, uh, I think students have learned a lot of things by your uh, presentation. So, if you allow, we can start our discussion for soon. Yeah, sure. So, we have got some question in uh, Facebook comment and in, in the also. So, okay. uh, the first question. Uh, so, how to get high con conversion efficiency of second harmonic generation in nonlinear photonic crystal? So can you, uh, would you mind uh, sharing the screen that you're looking at? So I can also read the question as well. Oh, sure. how, oh, there it is. How to get high conversion efficiency of second harmonic generation? Well, that's a good question. Uh, if you are to talk to engineer, okay, a nonlinear engineer, and that person will look at my simulations and the experiment and will say, well, um, what is the efficiency? And my answer will be, well, the efficiency is not high. It's... Uh, approximately 10 to the negative sixth at best, okay? So in uh, engineering, you can achieve efficiencies of the second ammonia generation significantly higher than that. Now, uh, but the systems in in these uh, nonlinear photonic and uh, nonlinear crystals are huge. So the sizes are really big. Our sizes are significantly smaller. So um, my sort of answer to this is uh, twofold. If you want to do the applications, um, doing some building devices, optical devices, uh, the nonlinear plasmonics is not there yet, okay? However, uh, the second part of the answer is uh, my interest in here is primarily to understand the interaction in fundamental physics of that. So this second harmonic generation is a really nice tool to probe how molecules behave, okay? So no, we are not building devices yet. Oh, that will be probably, I don't know, 15 years from now. But we are really trying to understand what the nonlinearity means and how molecules behave, okay? So I don't know if I really answered your question or not, but so that's... that's it. Thank you, sir, for your answer. So we have another question in the inbox. So what is... Optical plasmon. What is optical plasmon? I think uh, you have already you explained. Uh, what is optical plasmon? Uh, the question. Uh, okay, so uh, now, so if you open any um, uh, standard uh, solid state textbooks uh, and you go through, uh, let's say, Kittel, for example, right? The uh, classical um, uh, uh, quantum theory of solid state. Uh, you will see polaritons, plasmons, phonons, and so on. So um, from solid-state perspective, the word plasmon means it's a quantization of the oscillation of electrons inside metal, right? Now, what I'm referring to and what everyone in plasmonics referred to as a plasmon is the electromagnetic field associated with this oscillation. So that's the word optical. Optical means that your conduction electrons, when oscillate, they are coupled to the external field and the field of that oscillation on the surface of metal precisely corresponds to what we refer to optical plasmon. So optical plasmon is electromagnetic mode associated with this oscillation. All right. Thank you, sir. We have another question. So I can add the question in the screen. So why all the second harmonic generation experiments are performed by high repetition rate laser? Is there any reason for that? Uh, well, I'm the wrong person to ask this question because I'm a theoretician. In my case, the word repetition means I'm running simulations again and again. So uh, in reality, that's a good question. It's a good technical question, and I can only guess. So my guess would be uh, whatever laser you have access to, that is defined this uh, kilohertz or megahertz repetition rate. So uh, my apologies for not being able to correctly pinpoint the technicality of that. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, in these experiments performed by UC Irvine group on nanocrescents, 
um, in the paper, you can actually see what the reputation rate was. And I think it's also related to the bandwidth of the laser itself and the frequency at which you pump. So there is some... Um, uh, uh, um, so there is some uh, uh, relationship between them, which uh, primarily technical. So there is no fundamental reason why they are not doing this or that. Okay. Thank you, sir. So we have another question. So uh, we can. So what does the Gaussian filter do? I'm not really sure uh, uh, if I ever mentioned the word Gaussian in my talk. So uh, um, my answer will be. Uh, well, if you are my student, okay, and you come with this question, and we didn't discuss this question, I would say, uh, you tell me, take a look at the, what Gaussian filter uh, is. So, um, if you can, Amal, if you can um, write a couple of uh, more sentences, I'd be happy to address that in more details. I'm not really sure uh, what do you mean by that. So, if you can, uh, if you can uh, expand this question, I'll be happy to address that. Thank you, sir. So we have another question. So I uh, can you please discuss about nonlinear optics effect yeah. in optical fibers. So um, you know, um, yeah. So uh, I actually uh, a long time ago in my previous life I did some simulations of uh, um, pulse propagation in optical fibers, and um, we looked at what is called electrostriction effect. So electrostriction effect. This is a pretty cool thing. So imagine that you have. Um, uh, light propagating through fiber, and the profile of the light inside is in homogeneous, like a Gaussian, right? Here comes Gaussian word first time. So because of that, the um, the gradient or derivative of this profile is not zero. So this means the refractive index is changing under the influence of the gradient of the electric field. So basically, the system begins to uh, resonate and produces the uh, ultrasound okay so this is called electrostriction when the light excites the sound waves so this is one of the bad things that happen in these um, um, high um, uh, throughput uh, fiber optical channels where pulses generate these uh, um, uh, sound waves that are in turn create errors for the other pulses that propagate so this is one thing um, Another thing is uh, uh, there are lots of um, ideas of how to minimize losses, right? So one of them is to use soliton lights, right? Uh, soliton pulses. So this is also um, in regards to nonlinearity effect. And there are a bunch of others as well. So, but they are not as strong as those that we talked about uh, because they are usually persistent on the very long range. And so the intensities of all these pulses traveling through these fibers um, usually relatively low, but yeah, optical of uh, nonlinearity there is very, very important, of course. <coughs> Thank you, sir, for your uh, answer. So, uh, we have uh, no question uh, remaining, but uh, one question in inbox. So, what is nano crescent? Uh, if you explain, uh, maybe you have explained what is nano crescent? Yeah, yeah, so, um. What is crescent? Imagine that you have to uh, let me uh, let me start sharing it again. So I'll so share a screen, and then I'll share the screen one. Allow. There we go. So take a look at this thing. So imagine that you have two uh, circles: that dashed circle and the other circle, which is underneath that dashed circle. So if you put one on top of the other, that picture, the orange one, is what is called crescent, right? So the shape is called crescent. So uh, experimentally, people uh, people can do that. Uh, so they actually create a cylinder, and then they sort of dissolve a part of the cylinder like that, creating crescent. The word nano crescent means that the size of this crescent is very small. A, i.e. a nano size. So this is about maybe 50 nanometers thickness and about maybe 200 nanometers on um, the side. Okay. So thank you, sir, uh, for your wonderful presentation and excellent discussion session, sir. We'd like to say thanks again on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology, sir, and 
Uh, I will definitely invite you after the COVID uh, in my university for face to face session. Yeah, it will be my and pleasure. It will be a very great uh, day for our department if you will come to our university. So thanks again. Okay. And hopefully, we will arrange another web webinar with you if you have a time in your future. Bye for today. Of course. And see you very okay. soon. Uh, All right. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So bye, bye, bye for now. So good night. All right. Good night for here. Right, yeah. Bye.